Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Facts on the Ground. I'm Misty Winston, joined by my co-host, Jesse Zerowell. Uh, today, we have a very special guest. He is a trauma expert. He also teaches at Columbia and Adelphi Universities. Um, he is Professor Anthony Zinkis. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm really excited to talk to you. Thanks, folks. Very happy yeah, to be thank here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we um, really what I wanted to talk to you about what what prompted me to get a hold of you is um, with the Governor uh, Cuomo stuff that just came out. Um, you know, I am friends with Tara Reid. We've interviewed her. Um, she and I have worked together on a couple other things since then. Um, and uh, so my first thoughts when the, the you know, his resignation uh, was announced was obviously for his own victims and the survivors of his, you know, disgusting behavior. But then I immediately thought of Tara Reid because I I think that so often in the these conversations about powerful men behaving um, inappropriately, it, it's the aftermath that we don't really get to like dig into because this is not something that stops, um, you know, for the victims, for the survivors. And so I immediately thought, you know, how is this affecting Tara? Um, and, you know, I had texted her and told her that I was here for her if she needed to talk and all of that stuff. But maybe you can speak a little bit to what it's like for um, the survivor, because I think that's how it's not just um, women who uh, they're perpetrators are powerful men. I think this happens to women or victims, not just women, but in this particular case, women, um, for victims in general, it's not just when they're powerful people, um, even in like, like a random office space, like an, a random office workplace, um, you then have to deal with the person who victimized you, um, you know, being elevated, being promoted, being whatever it is. Um, so maybe we can speak a little bit to that. Um, and about how this kind of re-traumatizes people, um, uh, when these sorts of, sorts of things comes up come up and and those are para relationships too uh, first i just want a couple of disclosures i'm also friends with tara reed uh, and i you know have spoken with her about this as, as well as other things and uh just just so my trolls uh understand because <laughs> i think they they have a lot of trouble understanding simple concepts and as mm -hmm. a as a teacher i try to help people you know speak to their level uh I am here of my own volition and I'm not representing the views of my employers, as is clearly stated on my, uh, on my Twitter page. And we could get into that a little later about um, how they try to silence people uh, mm -hmm. like my, uh, which, which is, it, it's MAGA behavior and it, we need to call it out. Uh, but listen, so, you know, you, you talk eloquently about trauma. Trauma can stay with somebody for a lifetime and anything can be triggering. So what, you know, the fact that Tara can see the vindication of people like Lindsey Boylan, uh, Charlotte uh, ben Bennett, and, and the, other, the other women who came forward against Cuomo, who is a sexual predator, uh, and feel really good about that. But at the same time, she could feel uh, denied justice and betrayed by a Democratic Party, which has engaged in, and, and a mainstream democratic leaning media, which is engaged in smear attacks against her, a character assassination against her, spreading lies against her, and fueled rape culture for years and continues to do so with Joe Biden. So it's, it's bittersweet. We want victories for anybody who has been harmed in this way. And we can't just pick and choose the people we are okay with throwing under the bus. Cuomo became a liability to the Democrats they got rid of him. He didn't get it at first because he's a narcissist and a bully. And he thought, I can weather this storm. I'm not going to leave. And they were like, no, you're expendable because we can put another neoliberal right in your position. We're not worried about that. You were great. Now you're not. Um, but uh, what, what does that message send to women who don't have the powers aligned against their perpetrator, because here's the thing, rarely are the powers aligned against the perpetrator, whether it's a powerful man in government or Hollywood or business, or somebody like you said in an office situation, that that power relationship, and this is why mo most victims don't come forward, especially women, because we have a patriarchy designed to silence them and to harm them on a daily basis. They know this. So anybody who comes forward, it's a very courageous act, but to expect the powers aligning to always support those victims, I think that you know we have seen, and in the case of Joe Biden, there's more evidence against Joe Biden than anyone <laughs> has ever seen against any of these other politicians. I say this as a former director of two rape crisis centers. We worked on cases. I worked hand in hand with police and district attorneys and prosecutors 
I know what level of evidence exists in these cases. Carita is more corroborating evidence than, than Blasey Ford, who I believe in any of those people. So for her, I think it is bittersweet. And, and for her supporters as well, I'm angry. Yes. Why is it okay that we, you know, we should get rid of Cuomo? But by the way, we just let Cuomo decide when he leaves. What other job can you work at where you sexually assault or harass 11 women and it, it, it gets found out in a report that that's what you did and you get to say to them, I'm going to take two weeks before I leave. Where do you get to do that? Right. That's, that's insane. Like you should be gone that day. So there's positives here, but for the long term, I don't think anything has changed for victims with the with Cuomo's resignation at all. Anything. No, I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, glad glad he, I'm glad he's going. Yes. Nothing's changed. I'm glad you bring up the political aspect of the power dynamic too, because it seems almost unprecedented that there would be such a comprehensive AG investigation that would essentially conclude that he's guilty before really the shit hits the fan, the shit hit the fan, so to speak. So that I think points to, or backs up your argument that this is almost certainly a purely political move to replace Cuomo and usher in the next um, neoliberal figure who's uh, going to do whatever job Cuomo was uh, doing for his tenure. And I think that gets missed in a lot of these discussions, the, the political dynamic and how a machine like the DNC, they don't care whatsoever about victims or the trauma that they're going to endure for the rest of their lives. They are opportunists and megalomaniacs and um, that never really enters the discourse, especially in mainstream media. So I'm glad you bring up that point because I think that's something we really need to hammer home and um, more people should be aware of when confronting these cases and thinking about them uh, for themselves. Yes, and I'm also glad that you brought up the fact that Tara Reid supporters are angry because I am a supporter of hers. I'm a friend of hers, and I'm angry. Um, you know, you had Jen Psaki come out and say that it went. It um, you know has already been litigated. No, it hasn't. Tara Reid has never had an opportunity to um, tell her story um, in you know a court situation, or it's never really been investigated. And you're right, there is an unbelievable amount of evidence against Joe Biden. In fact, the you actually did a video a while back um, where you talked about the behavior of Joe Biden, and it shows like a montage of the clips of him with grown women and also with young girls. And those clips, and it, I mean, I'm just speaking for myself here, but I think that most women watching those clips. Um, are it, it's hard. It's hard because I've been that little girl where some creepy old dude thinks he can put his hands on you. And I think that that happens all the time and it's just become normalized. And now the president of the United States um, has just a multitude of evidence on video of him being physically inappropriate with children and he still managed to get elected. So yeah, damn straight. I'm angry. <laughs> like I'm really angry about that. He managed to get elected and get protected by the democratic establishment, by the donor class and by the media. You know, and my appeal is, I know there are good people. Let's, and and we, we've acknowledged sexual violence is not a gender specific issue. However, women are in a unique position in our society um, because it's a patriarchy. So I, you know, I, I've worked with, and I know people who are trans folk who are, very vulnerable to this kind of violence as well. And we don't uh, downplay it, uh, especially trans women, but it could be anybody. Uh, but the non-binary community has uh, has been harmed in very you know, specific ways. In addition though, we have to understand the dynamic between men and women in our society and that we've got a party in power right now that does not see the need to shift that power dynamic of the patriarchy uh, any more than the Republicans do. They'll put a nice face on it. So, you know, we have a woman who's a vice president. It's not lost on me, just like Barack Obama is, you know, he's a neoliberal too. But having a black man elected as president surely does have some positive ripple effects for especially young black children who look and say, wow, 
that that means something to me. So I understand that end. If that's all they do and they don't change the dynamic right now, which exists, is that men basically can do anything they want to women with impunity. Um, I can say this. I Let's talk about these people. I was in the room when Governor Cuomo, with Nancy Pelosi at his side, signed a bill to strengthen laws in New York against campus sexual assault. It was a good bill, right? And I spent a good part of a day working with now Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul, who will soon be governor, uh, on campus sexual assault issues. I worked with assembly members, state senators. I've worked with Kirsten Gillibrand's office pretty closely on these issues. I know these people. So let me just say this. The Democratic Party has rapists in its midst and they are protecting rapists to this day. I know these people. I know how they function. I know who they are. So I'm not the only one who is. And if we think Cuomo going under the bus means that that's not the case, we are grossly misinterpreting this. They're a rape cult. So are the Republicans. So is Hollywood. Let's go down the line. So is the fashion industry. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a conspiracy theory. There's too many victims to discount, you know, that view of things. Right. And unfortunately, what most people think of when, whenever a woman comes forward with an accusation, uh, they think of the incidents in which um, or perhaps incidents is too light of a word, but for lack of a better word, incidents in which the woman turns out to be lying. I'm thinking of Tawana Brawley, for example. And it seems men especially will always go back to that as an example and say, well, women make these claims all the time. They get high powered people to stand by their side, like Al Sharpton in the case of Tawana Brawley. And it turns out to be fakery. And like that one incident is used to write off all these other ones as if like we should start from the point that women are probably lying um, and then try to, um, you know, it's not even like they, it, there's an attempt to confirm um, what the women are saying. It's like they're lying and let's try to prove that they're lying. And False I think, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that that, that taints um, almost all of, of what's happening now um, with women coming out. And, you know, I wouldn't, I don't like to say making accusations. I like to say revealing or finally, um, you know, feeling comfortable enough to expose their trauma and to deal with it. And especially in a, in a public way, which, um, I don't think anybody needs to be reminded. It must be excruciatingly difficult. Uh, yeah, and I've experienced in my own life as a survivor of both workplace sexual harassment and sexual assault in my life, the difficulty in coming forward. And I'm a loud mouth advocate. And for me, not even in the public arena, it was excruciating. I was like, wow, you know, I'm all like, let's fight. And then when it came to me, I was like, let it go away, please. That's how I, my initial response was. But so let's talk about false accusations because rape and sexual assault seem to be the only area where we hold up false allegations as a template to, to not believe new people coming forward, sharing their histories of trauma. Uh, I live in New York. There was, a, there was a family on Long Island, a fairly wealthy family where the father had some money issues and decided to fake his own kidnapping and his son helped him. All right, okay, so do we now, every time there's a kidnapping be like, oh, you know, it's probably fake. Right. No, we don't. And it's a ridiculous thing that happened. I, I have to say, I would read this story and be like, wow, this is just, I wanna see the, the, the Netflix documentary on this. It's, it's fairly hysterical, but also something's obviously very wrong with that family, but they really did. He faked the kidnapping, he got arrested for it, so did the son. 
I knew a woman in the town I grew up in who faked being, she was a business owner. I was friends with her. She faked that our store was being broken into for whatever reason. And uh, they caught her, right? They, like, they caught her like, playing with the lock and doing stuff. So whatever, I don't know what her reasons were. But that doesn't mean anytime there's a robbery, you should be like, oh, remember that time the person broke into their own business. We don't do that with anything against sexual, ex except sexual assault. So that's the kind of thing that, you know, I don't, I don't pay much attention to it. And false accusations do happen and they're rare. If, if, a, if a victim or someone who says they're a victim is lying about sexual assault and rape, uh, which happens all the time, it's usually that they're lying and saying it didn't happen when it really did. Yeah. Okay. How, ask the 13 year old girl, like I worked with child sex abuse victims for years. Ask the 13 year old girl, how was the, how was the weekend at your dad's? And she says, it was fine. She doesn't say he raped me, but mm -hmm. I can tell you countless numbers of cases where that happened. And, and the, the, the survivors, the victims did not come forward on their own. Most of it was discovered by a third party. So it's just bullshit. The false accusation thing is bullshit. And as far as the idea, if I could just go on real quickly, of believe all women, I don't actually like the phrase believe all women. No. I do think we need to hear people and listen to what they're saying and then decide if it needs to be looked into and investigated. I didn't know what to make of Tara Reid's story when it came out. I read the thing in the intercept and I thought, okay, pretty effed up if Time's Up is doing this, because that was the first article, I think, or one of them. And then I listened to the Katie Helper podcast. I didn't know Tara Reid. She could have been, who knows, right? And in hearing that, based on my training, based on my expertise, I heard a trauma story being told. And I remember calling a friend after, and I said, literally, holy shit, this woman's telling the truth. Mm -hmm. I was floored. And then I spoke to her and I heard even more. And I am you know, completely in, in, under, in the understanding that Tara Reid is telling a trauma story about being sexually assaulted and harassed by Joe Biden. Yeah, to uh, me, there's no question about it. And the Katie Hopper interview was great. Katie Hopper did an amazing job. But for me, the thing that solidified it was watching her Megyn Kelly interview. Yeah. Because like you, I'm not a believe all women person. I'm a hear all women person because I'm a Julian Assange supporter. Um, you know, claims of sexual assault have been lobbied against him as a weapon. Um, and that happens. It's a political weapon. And that you, we can't deny that that's the case. But for Tara Reid, um, you know, I was willing to hear, I'm willing to hear anybody with those claims. Um, but her Megyn Kelly interview, when she was discussing discussing how he like um, leaned into her and like said, some, said something to her about like, you're nothing to me or whatever. And she physically like brushed him off. Like you could tell she was reliving that experience. And as Absolutely. a survivor myself, that I, I instantly knew she's telling the truth. She is 100% telling the truth. And you didn't need training for that. You had your own experience and I'm sorry to hear that. And, and, and you know, healing can happen and with that healing comes a wisdom. And then I dove into this field. So one of the things I, you know, and here's the thing that liberals hate it when I say this, like, yeah, I've trained over a thousand judges in New York state on sexual trauma. So I do know what the hell I'm talking about, right? You don't have to believe me just because of those credentials, but I'm not coming out of your left field, but you and I are seeing the same exact things. You don't need a degree to realize that when you see somebody telling their history of sexual trauma and they are obviously in pain, you know, they're reliving it. That's how trauma memories come out. That's what did it for me on the interview because I heard some clues in her speaking that made me think, oh my God, this is how trauma survivors tell their stories. Then I spoke with her on the phone. Then when Megan Kelly came out, I agree with you. You could see the pain. She and had a physical reaction to telling her story. And I, there's no way that I can discount that. I mean, that's that's instinctual. That's not something that you can force. You know what I mean? That's you cannot just, she, fake that. Yeah, no. Yeah. Trust me, you cannot. I've seen people tell stories that I'm like, you just, it's, it's, it's a non, it's not something you decide. It's to. involuntary. It's an involuntary yeah. action. You know, it's, you know, she was physically trying to get him off of her again, you know, all these years later. So, I mean, I just think that that's just something you just, I don't know how anybody could watch that interview with her and still, 
um, have doubts about her story. I mean, set aside all of the other cooperating evidence that she has, the Larry King call and all of the you know friends that she had told at the time about what happened to her. Um, I just think that it's it's really telling to me, like we spoke about earlier, how this is used as like a political football almost. Um, mm-hmm. That you know, Cuomo's survivors, Cuomo's victims were worth being heard, but Tara Reid was immediately discounted, immediately thrown under the bus. Well, she was ignored um, for a month first. Yeah, I mean, for longer, I think, because she tried to go to multiple outlets to try well, to get I her mean, story. One story broke on right. Katie Halper. The Times was the first outlet to cover it, and the New York Times didn't say a word for a month. Mm-hmm. A, little, a little under a month. And they did it. They released the story on Easter Sunday morning in their Sunday. And not for nothing, like not everybody celebrates Easter. Of course, I know that. And still, it was an interesting way to release it on a, t- on a day when they knew probably wouldn't get too, too, too much exposure. Um, but, you know, it's it, this is how they do it. It's They've got a playbook. They've got the rich have plans and the powerful know exactly what to do when these things happen. Uh, and it is that Darvo, right? You know, to what they do is they're reversing the victim and the perpetrator. Mm-hmm. And they turned Biden into a victim. Poor grandpa. Poor Oof. nice Joe Biden. Joe Biden is not a nice man. No. I no. challenge. Oh, and one other thing I wanted to say real quickly. You said, how can anybody watch the Megyn Kelly interview and not see the pain and the truth that Tara is talking about? Here's the reality. They don't watch these interviews. They didn't listen to Katie Halper. Stacey yeah. Abrams, when she stood on, on CNN on Don Lemon and repeated a lie. How that was dare disgusting. She, it was <laughs> disgusting. And I called her out when I was on the Tim Black show. Tim hasn't talked about this stuff much lately, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. But um, <laughs> it is what it is, you know, but I, I was happy to have the opportunity. But uh, I called around and I, and I said, that's a, 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 a complete lie. It's never been investigated. And you have, and I tweeted about this, Stacey Abrams and uh, Diane Feinstein and Nancy Pelosi. I mean, listen, there weren't men talking about it. It was just those women in power. Uh, none of them have listened to Tara's interviews. None of them watched the Megyn Kelly interview. They made a decision that this was inconvenient. Nancy Pelosi said it well, give her credit. She told the truth. I don't want to talk about this anymore. She said it. I hear you loud and clear, Nancy. Let's not talk about rape. Best, best we ignore it. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's it's disgusting how easily they can write off um, what happens. And also the hypocrisy that's just thrown in our faces without any regard for the fact that it's such grotesque hypocrisy. So for example, when... Um, the AG concluded its uh, investigation of Cuomo. Biden was one of the first people to say that Cuomo should resign. And the mainstream media, of course, didn't bat an eye at the hypocrisy of that. No pushback. Right. No pushback. In independent media, there was. But mm-hmm. I think that that just um, highlights what you were saying, uh, Anthony, even more that you know, the, the machine is so powerful that it, it just like steamrolls over, um, you know, hypocrisy, credibility, and it's it's just out for what it wants. It's like this Leviathan and there's no stopping it, it seems at this point. It's, yeah. the, it's the true definition of gaslighting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, that t- so sad, like that term has been used in my field for a long time accurately especially with domestic violence, intimate partner abuse, because gaslighting is, it, it, sadly, it happens a lot with, you know, with those perpetrators and victims. Now it's just this ubiquitous term that's thrown around anytime you don't like what, what somebody says, stop gaslighting. That's not what gaslighting is. Gaslighting is either, is denying a reality that both of you know to be true and acting like it's not the case. That's gaslighting. Right. So when a perpetrator of intimate partner violence uh, says to their partner, why did you pick the kids up at seven? I told you to pick them up at six when they know they told them to pick them up at seven. And so does the other person. And they act like, oh, you're crazy. You you know, Mm -hmm. you're hearing me wrong. That's gaslighting. And it's no different than when the mainstream media celebrates Joe Biden calling for the resignation of sexual predator Andrew Cuomo when they know 
there has never been an investigation into the multiple allegations of sexual harassment, inappropriate, harmful touching, and sexual assault against Joe Biden. And I know they know this because I've got screenshots of Lisa Lehrer, who did a lot of reporting on Tara Reid. None of it really good, but you know, whatever. She at least had the foresight to know, I have to come out and say, no, this case was never decided. We reached no conclusion. And the New York Times on May 1st of last year literally had an op-ed, and wasn't an op-ed from someone on the outside, it was their editorial board's opinion, official New York Times opinion, where they said, we are calling for a full investigation into the allegations against Joe Biden. They know it's never been investigated and then they act like it was, that's mm -hmm. gaslighting. And why would you do that? What are they getting from it? They're getting something, I don't know if you, you all have any ideas, but. I mean, they're getting um, the ability to use, I mean, use it when it's advantageous for them to do so. I mean. Yeah, and then the, the, New, the New York Times is, is essentially a mouthpiece for the Democratic Party. They basically print uh, DNC stenography. So mm -hmm. there's that aspect of it. They maintain CNN, access. MSNBC as well. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the way they frame it, the language they use, um, framing it as allegations against Joe Biden rather than framing it from the victim's point of view, I think is very telling. It should be about the victim if you're doing any kind of honest journalism and they reframe it from the point of view of the person in power and then try to distort it even further by saying, you know, the person in power may be the victim. And I think that's a crucial point to remember too, is the language that's used, the narrative that's put forth. And um, the Times doesn't just like pump out an editorial in 15 minutes and then publish it. It's carefully considered. Um, and I think the editorials, even more so than the actual recording that gets done in the paper, um, they speak for the paper itself more than, than the journalism, because it's like, this is coming from, the top brass of the New York Times. Yeah, agreed. So I, I can't, there's probably a laundry list of all the interests they have in, in putting forth such a narrative and, and spewing such lies. Um, but I think, you know, as Misty said, it's, it's access to power. And they're also doing the, uh, the bidding of the DNC. I think we're all quite well aware of that. Yeah, there's no question. All of, I mean, the, the majority of mainstream media is, um, I mean, it's all propaganda. It's all essentially um, corporate and state run propaganda. But I think that the majority of, um, you know, like the MSNBCs, the New York Times, the Washington Post, those are all like stenographers for the DNC. Um, you know, well, go, ahead. go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Talk about MSNBC. So let's talk about MSNBC. And MSNBC, of course, owned by NBC Universal. I've been interviewed on NBC, not MSNBC yet, but I was interviewed on NBC a number of times on sexual violence issues. Katie Tour, before she went national and started doing, uh, you know, campaign stuff, um, and she was fairly good on the issue. And she would call me up and she would say, like, uh, you know, I'd be about to have dinner on a Saturday and I'd get a phone call. Hey, want to come in to Thirty Rock and have a conversation about Sandusky? I'm like. Why not? I got nothing else to do on a Saturday night. So, you know, they, you know, at, in certain aspects, there would be good reporting. Mm -hmm. And you would say like, oh, OK, they're dealing with this issue in a fairly decent and sensitive way. So I'm I'm OK with that. And then Harvey Weinstein happened. And what did NBC do? NBC shut down the Harvey Weinstein investigation. And the people who were responsible for shutting it down knew full well that Harvey Weinstein was a serial rapist and that women would continue to be raped by him because they were shutting the investigation down. So when I say it's a rape cult and there are rapists in their midst and they know it and they're protecting them and I know these people, I'm not lying. So what happens, Ronan Farrow, working amazing with, job i mean he's doing an amazing job yes and working with rich McHugh breaks this wide open i mean the times did some reporting they won a pulitzer uh 
because of people like Rose McGowan, who they now throw under the bus, which mm -hmm. is just obvious. They treat victims of sexual assault no better than the perpetrators do. Uh, but Ronan Farrell got interviewed. I saw it on Rachel Maddow. And he was saying like, yeah, they shut this down. And you could see Maddow kind of like, what? What? Like, yeah, you're, you're where you work, protected a rapist. And it needs to be said, Hillary Clinton and the Clinton camp yes. also worked to shut the investigation down because Weinstein is a huge friend of the Clintons and the Obamas and a whole bunch of other Democrats. And he gave a lot of money and he got other people to give money and it would make them look bad. And they knew he was a rapist and they protected him. So, yeah, I love that people try to pretend like this, that especially the Harvey Weinstein thing. I'm some chick in Ohio and I knew like it's been rumored for years that Harvey Weinstein was an oh enormous God. creep. This is not like a secret. Like this is something that everybody. And, and so for like a Hillary Clinton to pretend that she didn't know that Harvey Weinstein was a giant creep. That's laughable. Again, I'm just some chick in Ohio. And I knew when it came out, I was not one bit surprised because no. this is something that's been rumored for decades. Did you uh, do you remember when Seth MacFarlane talked about it at the Academy Awards? Mm, oh yes, yes. I, he like I'm made gonna, a joke about it. Yes. And um, if I can if I can find it and bring it up, maybe we'll share screen in a little bit. But I yeah. thought it was very telling. Uh, he talked about it, and I believe it was 2013 or 2014 when he said this. Years, you know, a few years before the. Uh, the big story broke open with him and his joke was about the fact that everybody knew. Mm -hmm. So it's not a secret. Like I, I mean, the, the casting couch jokes have been going on since the invention of Hollywood, essentially. Um, and I mean, I don't know if you've seen, I'm sure you have since this is your field, but there's a, a documentary called an open secret about the, um, the child pedophilia that happens in Hollywood. And it's rampant. It goes on all the time. They have these huge parties with these producers and they bring in these children and they pass uh, who them around. Yes, and they pass them around. That's exactly what they do. They, it, it sounds crazy, and it sounds conspiratorial, and it sounds, you know, you know, all of those things. It happens on a regular basis. It's Remember not. This Elijah, is not. Is it Elijah yes. Wood? Elijah Wood has come forward. Um, Macaulay Culkin he, has said some things. Um, Corey Haim and Corey Feldman both um, yeah. uh, spoke out. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, well. it goes on all the time. Corey Haim. I think somebody who should be called out and taken to task more than they have been um, with regard to Harvey Weinstein is Quentin Tarantino, because he's openly admitted that he knew Harvey Weinstein was raping and sexually assaulting uh, women. And he continued to work with him anyway, because there was money involved. That was essentially his argument. Now he tries to, uh, when he talks about it, act like he's in mea culpa form, but, um, you know, the fact that he essentially aided and abetted what Harvey Weinstein was doing, and he can come out and say it with like a sad puppy face on and then continue making his annoyingly long movies and making money <laughs> off of them. It's, I mean, so many things to say about that and, um, and unpack there, but it's like the Hollywood machine and the DNC machine are, are one and the same. And, um, you know, the power dynamics and political dynamics uh, apply to both. Well, I mean, when you look at where power rests, it's never just one industry. It's the, all this overlap. And they all know each other and they're all friends. And, you know, we're, we're not in the club. As George Carlin said, it's a big club and you and I ain't in it. And I'm glad. I don't, I don't want to no. be in the rape club. <laughs> uh, I knew a guy who was the singer of a boy band from the 90s. The name of the band was LFO. Mm. I remember them. The, yeah, uh, I know. Um, I like girls that wear Abercrombie and Fitch. That's right. I so, couldn't think of a song, but I knew the name. Yeah, <laughs> and then he also sang "Girls," the girl from TV, "Girls of Summer." I think that was that one that was called. And then there was the girl from TV because he dated Jennifer Love Hewitt for a little while. And uh, Rich Cronin interviewed by Howard Stern. So the interview is available on YouTube, audio only, and it's in like two or three parts tells the story of how when he was a young, like, a, I guess like 19 or 18 or something from, from Boston, 
he and the the two bandmates drove all the way down from from like Boston to Florida to meet Lou Pearlman, who was the producer of a bunch of different like boy bands, and how Lou Pearlman greeted them at this man was sixty years old, greeted them out the door in his underwear. Mm-hmm. And then he said, Lou Pearlman had like basically each band had their sacrificial lamb. And this was a known thing. And which bands were they talking about? Backstreet Boys, In Sync, 98 Degrees. This was part of the landscape that you had to navigate if you wanted to quote unquote make it. And it's true in Hollywood and it's true in the music industry, which is music industry today still is like the last vestige of like completely unknown because people don't really talk about it, organized crime. Like it's, it's completely corrupt. Uh, and yeah, child rape happens all the time. What about those bodies of those, those First Nations indigenous children up in Canada mm-hmm. found buried beneath the private school? What do you think happened to them? So like, if we think organized rape of children especially powerless children doesn't hasn't existed for centuries and doesn't continue the catholic church did it and still does it it and still hides it (laughs) what and so when we when i talk about this the trolls will be like oh you're cute you're cute oh can we talk about that because here's what i think this is my theory i think that the whole pizzagate and the whole q thing was created invented in order to make this a third rail topic so that if you bring it up if you even want to talk about it you're brushed aside as oh you're q you're a conspiracy theorist no these things happen it's amazing because q um came along the pizzagate thing thing came along and everybody made fun of us, those of us who were willing to discuss mm-hmm. it and, you know, actually bring it up that this is a real thing that's happening. And then Jeffrey Epstein happened. And all of a sudden I'm like, see, y'all said we were crazy. And yet, yeah, was there like a child sex ring being run out of a pizza shop? Probably not. But no. th- these things are happening all over the place, all the time in elite and circles. I heard the pizza, Comic Pizza was really good by somebody I know that works in DC. That said, here's the thing. If, and I agree with you 100%, if they can take something <clears throat> that's true and then give a ludicrous interpretation of it, that becomes the thing that everyone listens. So is there, I don't even know that there's a basement of Comet Pizza, but they said in the basement of Comet Pizza, there was a child sex trafficking ring going on. And uh, why? Why would that be the case? What What is happening? It's a fairly odd and ridiculous claim to me, backed up by nothing. But are there people in both parties, including the Democratic Party in Congress, who've been guilty of uh, associating with traffickers of minor children? Yes. Participating in the trafficking of minor children? 100%. Do people remember in the, I don't know if it was the early or mid or late 80s, sometime like 40 years ago, was the Congressional Page Boy scandal. The mm-hmm. Congressional Page scandal. Look it up. Dennis He's, Haster, is that his name? Den- there was a Dennis Haster or something like well, that. Dennis there was Haster, a Republican. Yeah, he had to yeah. resign. Yes. He had to resign because of child sexual abuse. He was a teacher or a principal. In Text school. messages were just leaked from Hunter Biden that looked very suspicious. Um, no. Th- <laughs> no, no, we can't talk about Hunter Biden. Oh. See, they did that. They, po- I call it poison pilling. They right. poison pilled that. Mm-hmm. It's an inoculation. So now if I say Hunter Biden's corrupt, well, wow, you're just blah, blah, blah. Everything's it's, Hunter Biden. You're a conspiracy theorist. You're Russian, Russian, disinformation. Russian disinformation. They do that intentionally. And you're right. Poison pill is a great term for that because that's exactly what they do. And th- so that that just, it, it discourages people from talking about it because they don't want to look like they're weird. They don't want to look like they're conspiratorial. They want to fit in. So they don't want to talk about it. They won't look into it now. They're, it makes people scared to even discuss it. And here's the thing. I would rather investigate a million cases of child abuse and be wrong then yes. fail to investigate one and have been right. And so I don't care if you want to call me crazy, if you want to say I'm a conspiracy theorist, if you want to say I'm a pizza gator. No, I know that child abuse is happening in elite circles on a regular fucking basis and it's wrong and we should do something about it. Yes. And I am <laughs> that not- shouldn't a, be controversial. I was called a pizza gator mm-hmm. on, uh, on Twitter by the, by, by the silly trolls who work for uh, and are most likely just Sally Albright. Um, or David but, Brock. And David Brock, 
who is affiliated with the pizza place, right? So maybe that's why they thought that was it. But um, I am not a pizza gator. I am a pizza eater, though. I do love pizza. I just had a slice before we started. I'm in New York, so I have the good pizza. (laughs) You have to eat pizza. (laughs) It's like Um, the rules. Where do you go? Do you want to? Do you want to plug the uh, pizzeria? Yeah. (laughs) You could start a fight here. (laughs) <laughs> all right well it's 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 on Long Island. it's called Rocco's okay. Rocco's, and Rocco's in called, New York fam yeah if you can't you know but there's uh I've got my favorites in the city and in Brooklyn and you know but you, I you can't really find too many bad slices in, in New York so yeah there's that um I, I hashtag Pizzagate to get into it. Hashtag means you want to be part of a conversation. Mm-hmm. And I hashtagged it years ago to get part of a conversation. They're like, ah, he's a Pizzagator. So now you're going to discount everything I said. But let me tell you that, yes, there are child sexual abuse rings going on at the highest reaches of power in government, industry, uh, entertainment, part of academia. My God, right? So people forget, I was a director at a rape crisis center that at two of them, but one of them had a child advocacy center where every single case of child sexual abuse that was reported got investigated. I literally worked side by side with the special victims detectives. I knew everything that was going on with these cases. We had cases of kids that were child stars in Hollywood, okay. We had a case, and I'm just always careful about identifying information, of a very powerful man in academia who sexually abused and worse than that, tortured, well, not worse, it just as bad as that, sexually abused physically abused, but emotionally, psychologically tortured. And I'm talking about silence of the lambs ship. This case was investigated, right? To at least two children. There were reasons that mistakes were made in the investigation and he did not end up getting criminal charges, but he's not allowed to be near those children. So he leaves the state. And I looked him up because I know his name. He's working. He's in another academic institution. I know people that were part of ritual abuse gangs that would ritually sexually abuse kids. And one of them was a juvenile when it was happening. So I think she was sexually abused by the the adults who ran it. So I have empathy for the, I want her to be okay, but I don't know that she ever got help. I know that she went to a juvenile facility and then left there and ended up becoming a teacher. She's working right now. And this was like ritual abuse. This stuff is real. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it also happens in, in non spectacular ways too. Like lots of people are victimized. How, how many women by the time they reach college age are sexually assaulted uh, or, or attempted to be raped or raped? One in five. I think that's low. And I agree. But I would it, like to meet the other four because I've 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 never met another woman who hasn't had some experience of <laughs> sexual harassment, sexual assault, um, throat harassment in there. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. probably seventy five percent at least. But the point is, we know that it happens. Well, who do you think these perpetrators are? Right? Are they just guys like waiting in the alleyway, sneaking up on people? No, it's your boss. It's it's somebody's your neighbor, father. your classmate, your friend, your the clergy member. Mm-hmm. I was sexually abused by a member of the clergy who taught at the high school that I went to, right? It took me forever to, to acknowledge that it was even sexual. So when I came forward, I used to say, I would tell certain friends like, oh, this happened. I'm like, it wasn't like really sexual. I'd said that, but it was, he was touching me and it was disgusting. And I look back now and think that affected me. I yeah. just did at the time, but you know, isn't it easier to live in the world where everybody's lying about it than the world where we've got a bunch of people perpetuating it and we have to hold them accountable? It's a real problem. I don't think people, I don't even think that I grasp how prevalent it is. 
Um, I think that it's, you know, but again, like I just said, I, I've never met a, another woman who's not had some level of sexual harassment in her life, whether right. it be cat calling or whether it be any number of things being uh, sexually harassed at work. I mean, I used to be sexually harassed by my boss on a regular fucking basis in a restaurant. He pushed me up against, um, oh. stuff in the, in the walk-in cooler and would try to grope me. Like that happened on a regular basis. Um, and I've worked in restaurants. Yeah. It's, it's bad. It's bad. And it's not really? just from the employees, it's the customers. Oh. I used to be a bartender. <laughs> it's uh, unbelievable the things that you will hear and the things that people will try to do to you. They get drunk and they think that they get to touch you. It's like a real problem. Um, I don't, how do we even address that though? Because it seems like it's so ingrained in society that this is just like a thing. It's just like a thing. And people, it's, it's really amazing to me how quickly people are willing to brush it off. Like it's not a big deal. Um, like yeah. cat calling is not a big deal. That's a big deal. It's, I mean, it, I, I understand that it's not like, that's not a physical threat, um, mm. but it makes, especially for myself, I'm just speaking for myself here as a survivor, it's threatening. Like that's a, like that makes me feel physically unsafe because I don't know if that cat call is going to turn into being ch like chased or followed right. or whatever. And it's it, people brush that off. Like it shouldn't be something that bothers a, a, a woman or, I mean, I'm sure it happens to men too. Um, I just, for me personally, as a woman, I don't like to speak from my own perspective. So I don't mean to like discredit the male experience. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, but like, just for me, it's like that, it, even though it's just a cat call that it implies a, a potential threat. Um, yeah. And, and having lived in New York for 10 years, uh, I don't anymore, but I can't tell you how many times I not only heard cat calls, but I would hear this attempt at justification put forth by so many men men I worked with, um, it's a compliment. random people I met in bars, <laughs> but they often said, well, how are you going to dress like that? And then go out and, and get upset. I can dress when... however the right. fuck I want to. How about right. that? <laughs> right. And the, the skewing of the distortion, um, the gymnastics they would go through, I could see like their minds working as they were saying this. And I don't know if they actually believed it or they were just caught up in, um, you know, the patriarchal culture, um, which is especially just like in your face every day in New York, at least what I experienced. Um, but yeah, Misty, I just wanted to like hammer home what you said. It seems that rape, sexual assault, sexual harassment have become so prevalent and they are so prevalent that the default response now by so many people is like, well, you know, here we go again. I don't, I don't want to deal with this. Um, it happens, you know, that's just part of the industry or whatever. Didn't we already do that? Didn't we do that three right. years ago? Right. We already did that. Yeah. Did you we know, oh, we got rid of Cuomo. Yeah. Yes. That, that's what I'm worried about. Um, and maybe you can speak to that a little bit because I feel like this, um, uh, this whole Cuomo resigning is going to be held up as like, oh, well, the Demo see, the Democratic Party holds its own accountable. I'm already seeing it. Um, um, Mehdi Hassan did like a whole um, monologue where he was like, well, Republicans never hold their own accountable. Look, the Democratic Party does. Um, Joe Biden is president, douche canoe. Like, what he's, are you talking about? <laughs> he's like a silent partner in the Biden administration. He's terrible. He re like, he is legitimately terrible. What happened right. to him? I don't know, but he's legitimately <laughs> terrible. <laughs> But yeah, he was oh. saying that, you know, Republicans, what only happened? Democrats Whoa. hold their own accountable. And I'm that, worried about yeah. that because it's, it's being used now um, as like this, um, I don't know, this uh, almost protection for the Democratic oh, yeah. Party. So, I mean, no. what, what do like we do say, to combat that? You're having sex with somebody and they want you to use a condom. Your response can't be, well, I used one last time. <laughs> okay. And today is different. Um, but I really don't think we should gloss over the fact that you called Mehdi Hassan a douche canoe <laughs> and uh, that I've never heard the term douche canoe, but I want to always hear it now. <laughs> so I thank you, Comrade Misty, uh, for just being amazingly awesome. So I, have to, I have to say that whenever Misty uses that term, the only image that comes to mind is an empty canoe floating on a lake. I don't know why that is. Like, like... I hear the douche, but that doesn't factor into it. It's just right. like this empty red canoe, sadly floating on a lake. So, yeah, yeah. that was very poetic, Jesse. Uh, well, I did go to grad school for poetry, so <laughs> he just Is turned it? douche canoe into like. Yeah, I went to Hunter. <laughs> oh, awesome. Funny. 
No, I, I'm not kidding. Your pro, your prose is poetic. I, I pick up on it. But, <laughs> he is um, pretty gifted, actually. <laughs> yeah, and the, I, I want to talk about that. Like when we get a, a moment uh, too, how do we stay sane and thrive among all amongst all this uh, d d negativity? And I think creativity uh, is one of the ways that we need mm -hmm. to take our humanity and collective connectivity back. And so I, I'd like to talk about that a little bit later, but uh, you were talking about Mehdi Hassan. So, you know, I, I responded to him and his terrible tweets. Mm. And I, you know, I, what happened to him? They, they paid him a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's fun to see yourself on MSNBC and to be on television. I get, I, I've been on TV a bunch of times. And it's nice to be, I mean, I'm, I'm rarely on to talk about something fun. Usually it's like, child we understand rape, <laughs> but i like that i'm able to put my voice out there and i obviously am a little controversial and i just say what comes to my mind and they're like whoa i can't believe you said that i'm like well it's the truth you should shouldn't be so surprised at what the truth sounds like but well controversial said, by whose standards right yeah. yeah i mean that's the thing but like uh, you know what's controversial rape should be controversial and so these are the kinds of things like why how how is it that we can agree to be wrong and everyone nods their heads that collective agreement where now it's no longer gaslighting it's like we've all convinced ourselves it is true the democrats are better than the republicans because we get rid of sexual offenders look at cuomo and look we made poor al franken resign just for a photo which is not why he resigned right and we agree with that and ignore the fact that Joe Biden has been accused by eight women of harmful, inappropriate touch. He has been caught on video and as an expert in sexual violence, who's trained thousands of adults on what behaviors to look out for around their kids that may be dangerous. Joe Biden engages in unsafe behaviors. I don't know that he's a predator of children. I God, I hope he isn't, but his behaviors are not safe and they need to be called out. And one of the eight women who accused him of harmful and appropriate touch accused him of specifically sexual harassment and then sexual assault. So no Mehdi Hassan, the Democrats aren't better. No. There's a long list of Democrats. Bill Clinton was just at the convention as a featured speaker. He is a credibly accused rapist. And even if he wasn't, he had sex in the middle of the day with a 22 year old intern who he had oral sex with, who had oral sex with him. Now granted that was a consensual act, but the power dynamic. Yeah, mm -hmm. that I don't even know that you can call it consensual. It is because she was a grown adult and she was, yes. yes. But he, that he's literally the most powerful man on planet earth. This isn't just like a boss in an office or whatever, cause that's still bad, but this is, is literally the most powerful man so on planet earth. Let's talk about the boss in the office because anybody in an office that I've, I, wherever I've ever worked and I've not only worked in this field, you know, I've worked at restaurants. If somebody, ha well, in the restaurant, actually, I won't put it past them because it's like the Wild West a lot of it the It is pretty bad in restaurants. But um, most places, most offices that you work, if somebody, uh, if someone gave a blowjob to somebody in the office and it was an intern to a person that worked there who was a powerful person, especially a boss, they would be gone that day. Yes. Let I, I, so when people like, oh, it was only, you know, it was only a blowjob. And it was, like, it was with an intern who was 22 years old and her life was turned upside down. Thank Ruined, God. really, for a while. I mean, I know that she's recovered, I'm sure, to some degree. I can't speak to like on a personal level or whatever. I'm sure that she still deals with a lot of, you know, yeah. stuff. I don't know how you couldn't. She how was, you I mean, a normal she, relationship after that. Well, I mean, she was made uh, like the butt of every joke for years. Well, and why? Why did we do that? I don't know. Why do we? Why is our society not making Clinton the butt of the joke? Like, right? and he should be have our ire. But like, dude, what you did was wrong. Something wrong with you that you would compromise the American people that way to put yourself in that position and exploit a young woman that way. Who think about Tara Reid and think about. Monica Lewinsky, because even though what happened to them is different, 
their experiences overlap in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Both of them were exceptionally bright and very motivated to work in Washington. Mm -hmm. They both had a desire to serve. They were in it, and I've heard both of them speak about this for the right reasons. They're the kind of people you want working in government at some level. And both of them entered into it excited at the possibility. Can you imagine how happy Monica Lewinsky was when she found out that she was going to be working in the White House. My God, look, not for nothing. Like I hate most presidents, but that opportunity must be thrilling. I talk, We and talked how, to Tara Reid about this. because how excited she was about working for yeah, Biden. Because she and said then, that Joe Biden was like one of two places that she applied to. And I was like, well, what is that like? Like what is to get that phone call and to know that that's, you get that job. Like that's a really, um, you know, not a lot of people get to do that. And that must've been really thrilling. And she's, yes, it was. And I, to me, it's like, I, it makes my heart break even more because they go in, um, you know, like you said, wanting to serve and being excited and wanting to make a difference. And then it ends up being nothing like what they expected. Not only that, I can liken it to the story, a heartbreaking, I'll tell a very quick version of it. I heard of a man, he was in his mid to upper 60s when he told the story. It was at the veterans, the VA hospital. And I was part of, uh, of a day where, you know, I was one of the speakers talking about sexual violence in the military and trauma. And this guy stood up and said, all my life, ever since I could remember, I wanted to be in the Navy. When I was little, I wanted to dress up like a sailor at Halloween, and I, I got the model ships. That's like anything I could do, a movie, read a book about. That's all. I did, lived and breathed the Navy. That's all I wanted. And I finally got into the Navy, and it was the most exciting. When I finally got to be on the ship, to go out into sea within two days, I was raped by three men. One was my superior within two days. Everything he hoped for and believed was crushed one night. And I think about Tara and yeah. I think about Monica Lewinsky and I think how men will do, many men will do anything to crush the spirit and crush the dreams of those that they see as below them. And sexual violence is one of the most harmful ways to do it. And I think that's why they do it. Yeah, and just going back to Bill Clinton, I don't know if you remember, I'm sure you do, but when the hammer was really coming down on him, he bombed uh, Sudan uh, of all places. And uh, I just wanna read real quickly from uh, <clears throat> Max Blumenthal's latest book because he has a passage about this and I want to read from it because it speaks to the geopolitical ramifications that this can have and how horrible they can be how other countries other peoples can be used as chess pieces in the manipulations and uh, machinations I'm Seth the and um I'm so Seth I'll, I'll, the host of the Oscar sorry that's okay no. I'll read <laughs> like, I'll read that? this I'll read this uh, quickly. Cruise missiles fired from a Navy warship in the Persian Gulf had aimed to destroy an Al-Qaeda nerve gas factory in Sudan that, according to Clinton, was co-owned by bin Laden. Instead, the strikes launched on the basis of bunk intelligence decimated a pharmaceutical plant that supplied 50% of the medicine to one of the poorest countries in the world. The bombing wiped out Sudan's supply of TB vaccinations and eliminated its supply of cru crucial veterinary drugs that prevented the transfer of parasites from animals to small children. Furthermore, several cruise missiles failed to explode. Al-Qaeda seized them and sold them on the black market for $10 million each, allegedly to China. A separate series of cruise missile strikes hit an Al-Qaeda camp in Khost, the old network of bases and tunnels that bin Laden had built for the CIA. And then it goes on uh, beyond that into, into other details and issues. But point being that, um, you know, these perpetrators like Clinton will go, I mean, there's no limit to what they will do to protect themselves, even if it means something as despicable as essentially committing a war crime to distract from 
the hammer coming down on on what he did and it speaks to how often war is used as like a an approval rating booster (laughs) right if your approval ratings are down start a war your numbers will go up it's disgusting (laughs) it's it's not a stretch this is one of the things i tried to warn people about i wasn't the only one joe biden would touch children inappropriately and unsafely in front of their parents while being videotaped and not care a whit that people might see him. If Joe Biden could walk up behind Lucy Flores, a perfect stranger that he had never met before, just a minute or two before she was about to go and speak as a candidate, excitedly, oh my God, the vice president is endorsing me. This is so exciting. And then he walks up behind her, puts his hands on her shoulders, presses his body up against hers, sniffs her hair and plants a long, slow kiss on her head. And by the way, why would he do that? Why would he do that? To fuck with her brain before she went out and made that speech. Mm-hmm. He's not. He's not the most the smartest guy in the world, but as a predator, he knows exactly what he's doing. Mm-hmm. So um, it's not a stretch to think that a man like that or a man like Bill Clinton could then turn around and indiscriminately destroy the lives, especially of brown children, but people all over the globe, that they would do that without blinking an eye speaks to why I say, as a mental health professional who understands what these words mean, that our government is run by psychopaths and sociopaths. Because I say that all the time. I'm not a mental health professional, but I think that that's a very accurate statement. And I have to just say this again. It doesn't matter that I have the credentials because you and I are saying the same things, but it matters to the liberals. For some reason, mm-hmm. they the top 20%, Thomas Frank defined it really well, that professional class. They live in this bubble. They love academia. And they love, you know, these institutions and all that stuff. Well, hey, I work for one of them. Hey, I worked closely. Like I said, I spent half a day working with Kathy Hochul on sexual violence issues. I was in the room when Cuomo signed the bill. I talked to senators and assembly members all the time and state legislators and Congress members and national senators. And you know what I know? This is the world that they live in. They love, they love it, they love it. So when one of their own ostensibly comes out and says, you're all psychopaths or sociopaths. And I know because I know you people, I've heard you. I, there was a bill before the New York state legislature, which ended up passing and the governor's office got a hold of it. And they were the ones who kind of like, they were like, we want this bill passed. So they wrote it and then they gave it to uh, an assembly member and a state senator to kind of float in their houses and then they agreed on it. And it was a bill to expand child abuse reporting, right? The idea of it was really good. And I'm not gonna get into the like the nitty gritty and nuts and bolts of it, but I can tell you as an expert in child abuse and trauma, I read the bill and said, oh, this is definitely not doing what they say it's doing, but I understand why they think it does. Let me call them and let them know. And here's what the senior staff in the governor's office told me. He laughed and he goes, listen, you know, it's not perfect. And maybe it doesn't do what we say it's going to do, but let's just pass it. We can worry about it later. Mm. Well, no, that's a terrible idea. And that's how they are. That is a terrible idea because then that prevents like a legitimate bill that could do the thing that they say that it's going to do from getting passed. That would take longer. And now it's in the news and we want to like, you know, it's optics. It's all optics. They don't care. So like, do they care about child abuse? No. Do they care about, do they care about racism? Like who are they killing around (laughs) the world? No, they don't. They just gave 750 more million dollars to the police. They just, signed unanimously dem signed a bill that said um that any community that defunds the police at all would be uh would shit. be penalized in some way i forget like yeah. they would like, not get federal funding for something yeah, yeah. Or... And, and bernie bernie sanders is on board with that yeah and i think that 
there's an irony and a contradiction there because if you're so who's funding the police the local governments so if you're going to reduce funding to a local government who's funding the police you're thereby contributing defunding to the, the defunding police. the police yeah uh albeit indirectly and through absolutely sanctions on local governments but it's, it's disgusting yeah and um I'm you done know, with Bernie Sanders. Me too. Yeah. I've been done with Bernie Sanders for a very long time. I'm very glad that more people are coming on board with being done with Bernie Sanders. I never thought he was a, a rock star anyway. Like I no. liked much of what he said and believed he would do some of the things he said. Or at least but try. I, right. And I was never like under the, like, uh, I, mean, I look, I've heard him speak live. It is very exciting. The guy with, you know, when he talks about breaking up the banks, I'm like, my God, how are they not, how are they not like they're hurting this guy in some way, but they just won't let him be president. But the bottom line is I'm done. Yes. I'm done because the, in, a, in the midst of a large popular uprising against racist policing and systemic racing, one of the biggest protest movements in the history of this country, sustained protest movements, we elected the author of the crime bill who picked a, 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 you know, a, a top cop who bragged about putting black and poor people in jail as his VP. We gave $750 million more to the police and we just threatened communities that we would punish them if they diverted funds from policing to social work where it's needed as a social worker. So that's, you know, thank you, Bernie. Thank you, squad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, and we talk that. about we talked about gaslighting earlier. Um, Bernie Sanders telling everybody that Joe Biden's a decent man and a good friend. That's gaslighting. Everybody knows that that's bullshit. Joe Biden is not a decent man. Joe Biden is a war criminal. If your friend, your good friends are war criminals, you need better friends. Period. And, I, and I, the other thing, too, is Bernie, I don't doubt Joe Biden. You think he's your friend, but I don't get your I don't give a shit. You're I don't running, think he thinks he's his friend. I, but you're running for president. I don't need to right. hear it because he's not our friend. He's, right. he's not a friend of the working class. So I don't care if you like him personally. I don't give a shit. And you shouldn't be wasting my brain time as I'm watching this debate talking about him being your friend. Nobody gives a shit who your friends are. 70,000 Americans a year die because we don't have access to health care. And that's because before the pandemic. And you're yeah. talking about that he's your fucking friend. He what does that, what does that even mean anyway? That they I don't know. Wine spritzers My friend together. Is a rapist? Like, okay. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If if war criminals are your friends, you need better friends. Like, stop gaslighting the American public. He's not my friend. He's Captain Crime Bill. Really? You're going to go tell Black Americans that he's their friend? That's disgusting. That's really disgusting. That's a betrayal. Captain Crime Bill. In, let's think about this. Captain Crime Bill in a douche canoe. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like a really great like comic book series or something. <laughs> I was thinking, Jesse can write, and then I don't know who can do the illustrations. Well, but... I call um, uh, Biden and Harris uh, Captain Crime Bill and the Cop. That's their that's their buddy comedy uh, duo name. So Captain Crime Bill and the Cop. Yeah, I mean it's oh, oh. you know. <sighs> Bernie Sanders is the unbelievable betrayal b- betrayal that he committed against his supporters twice um, is astonishing to me. And the fact that anybody still takes him seriously, the fact that anybody took him seriously after 2016, because I was done. I, I, I was like you. I never thought he was a rock star. I thought maybe we can move it back a little bit in the right direction yeah. before we head over the cliff. That was like my hope for him. Mm-hmm. Um, but then for him to walk off the field after WikiLeaks handed him everything he needed everything. to actually fight. Um, and he just, you know, we got to vote for Hillary Clinton. Fuck off, dude. Julian Assange, and he won't even say Julian Assange's name. It's been mm-hmm. two and a half years since Julian Assange was he kidnapped can. from the Ecuadorian embassy. He won't even say his name. Fuck he Bernie can't, Sanders. He can't, he can't even utter the three letters BDS, let alone right. discuss oh. discuss it out. The merits. The, the, only, the only context he'll, he'll discuss it in without even saying the letters most of the time is uh, it's a First Amendment issue. And yeah. that's as far as he'll go. Right. And. And I think, you know, he doesn't do this stuff by accident. He does it on purpose because he's a water carrier for the DNC. And they yes. know that he still has a lot of influence with people and can be used to convince people to gaslight them, to mind fuck them into still he supporting is a the shrewd DNC. politician. 
He is, people like to claim that he, oh, he's just a nice guy. And he just, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't know who he's, he knows exactly who the fuck he's dealing with. He's a shrewd politician. He has done a very good job of creating an image around himself. He's cre invented this mythology surrounding himself. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows that he can talk about voting against the Iraq war without mentioning why he voted against the Iraq war and with leaving out the fact that he voted for intervention two times under President Clinton um, mm -hmm. and that he voted to fund the Iraq war every time that it ever came up. So he He's very, he, he knows exactly what he's very shrewd. He knows exactly what he's very calculated. There's no yeah. question about it. Yeah. I have no and, time or love for Bernie Sanders anymore. And then, <laughs> and, and, and then I was just going to add to that, going back to the New York times, there was recently a piece that Maureen Dowd did where she oh. hung out with um, Bernie Sanders for like a weekend or like on a Saturday afternoon. And literally um, I forget what the headline is, but the subheader was something like, like I hung out with Bernie because I wanted to get, I wanted to know how he likes his latte and um, if he likes Gouda, like shit like that, that just, it's just infotainment. Just fluff. But, it's fluff. but there's a reason they publish stuff like that. It's not just to in, like entertain people or provide infotainment. It's to, again, like continue this, um, like continue to prop him up in the position he's in as a water carrier for the Democrats. And look, he's just, the, he's this like hip guy. He's this old like hipster who likes lattes and, and rare cheeses or whatever. And that again, goes back to the narrative control and the framing. Mm -hmm. I would yes. worry about rare cheese. <laughs> I would want only to eat cheese that I know other, lots of other people were eating and they were okay after eating it. That's yeah. Don't, don't, I know that I know the latte was in there, but don't quote me on the cheese part. But it was it was it, it was, was very, something there. stupid out like there. That. Yeah. yeah. So I just I, I have the news on in the background uh, and it says just in New York State Assembly to suspend Cuomo impeachment investigation. Oh, those feckless Democrats. I am calling it now. OK, so on what grounds? I just don't feel like it. He's resigning. He's resigning. So why do they need to bother? He murdered people too. Everybody needs to remember that. He My murdered aunt. a bunch of elderly people. And that's that's yeah. getting completely left out of the conversation because of this, which I think is part of why they're um, you know, making are having him resign for this stuff is because if they have to talk about the fact that he murdered people <laughs> with COVID, well, listen, that's a whole aunt, other ball of wax. My aunt was 75 and she contact contracted COVID within days of being placed in a nursing rehab facility and died alone with an iPad held up to her so her kids could say goodbye. Oh, God. So let me say from the bottom of my heart, <sighs> fuck you, Andrew Cuomo, you piece of human garbage. He should be in prison. <laughs> okay. And, and you know, he may see some jail time. I'm not confident. He I is white be. and wealthy and powerful. So usually yeah. They never end up in jail. And if they do, it's because they know something about other white, powerful people. And then they make it look like they killed themselves. Jeffrey Epstein's out right. Of or they screwed over other wealthy white people like Bernie Madoff. If you fuck with other oh, wealthy oh, yeah, white yeah, people, yeah. then they'll come Listen, for you. Or if you know something, they'll come for you. I'm That's a the Met only two fan, times. And Bernie Madoff screwed over the family that owns the Mets. So I was pretty upset about that because it meant we couldn't get the players we needed. But like that's in my own weird little like compartmentalization. Right. Right. I know it's capitalist craziness. But the bottom line, yeah, if he just defrauded poor people like what, like Wells Fargo did mm -hmm. by like by didn't not selling but giving people financial products or selling them financial products they didn't need, which cost them money, and they were poor and couldn't afford it, and the, nobody went to jail for that. But so what it means now that we're not impeaching Cuomo is this: he can run for governor again. Oh. Yeah, I I just got a uh, a Times notification on my phone. And it says Carl E. Heasty. I think that's how it's pronounced. It might the be head of the assembly. Right. The speaker of the assembly said the impeachment inquiry was now moot since its main objective was to determine whether Co Mr. Cuomo, a third term Democrat, should remain in office. Mr. Heasty, a Bronx Democrat, also said he believed lawmakers did not have the constitutional authority to impeach a governor who was no longer in office. Stop it. Carl Heasty, you, fuck you, you were also a piece of human garbage and you just shit on rape victims. And you, the Democratic Party of New York has shown itself to be the party of rape enablers and rapists. And so they just protected him. He's still in office. You could impeach him tomorrow. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm they sorry. should. They they need to. This is not a controversial position. If, if my if he's if he grabbed me and I had worked for him and I see like this guy can come back. How am I ever going to rest easy? That's my perpetrator. And like he did this to a cop and they still don't give a shit. Carl Heasty's a horrible legislator, a piece of garbage, doesn't care, cozies up to power. And, and you know, not for nothing, I got questions for Kathy Hochul. My question mm-hmm. for, for Kathy Hochul is, what did you know about Andrew Cuomo being a sexual predator and when did you know it? Because you now, know maybe, they knew. Maybe you know she they found knew. out with the rest of us, but I would I think someone should ask her the question. Did you ever hear anything or witness anything that made you concerned that Andrew Cuomo might be a sexual harasser or sexual predator? Someone needs to ask Kathy Hochul this question because if you did know and never acted on it, that's a problem. Mm-hmm. So all no, these people- protect- it, But it's, this is always the case though. Powerful people, by the time they get caught, it's been going on for a very, very long time and lots of people knew about it because you don't hang out in those circles without hearing. It's like I said, with Harvey Weinstein, I'm just some chick in Ohio and I knew like, like stuff like that travels, the rumors travel, people talk. Um, and so obviously these people knew something. And we know that, you know, people like, um, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, these people all know, they all hear these things. They can't pretend that they didn't. There's no way for us to prove that they knew in advance or that they had any like previous knowledge, but of course they know. I mean, it's no different than any other social circle. There are rumors that go around. Can That's- I can I play that Harvey Weinstein clip yes. with Seth MacFarlane really quickly? Yes. Sure. I set it up. And then we'll let you go. We've taken up an hour and a half of your time. We'll let you we'll, Oh, we'll, I'm sorry. We'll that. No, um, no, it's our fault. We do this all the time. <laughs> Uh, let me just see if this comes up. Can you yep. see the screen? Yes. Mm-hmm. So let's, all right, here it is. This is what started playing before and I, I didn't tell And this it. is from 2013, you said? I right? believe it's 2013. Okay. So, some years ago. Uh, if you don't know who I am, just pretend I'm Donny Osmond. You'll be fine. We'll get through this. I'm not sure why uh, we don't wait till noon to do this since the only people who are up right now are either flying or having surgery. Um, <laughs> But I want to congratulate today's nominees and also to congratulate those who weren't nominated. You can stop doing interviews where you pretend that you had such a great time making the movie. And here to help me out, since there's nothing creepier than a guy standing by himself in Hollywood at five in the morning, is the lovely and talented Miss Emma Stone. Emma Stone is the star of the new film Gangster Squad. That's, I'm not sure you're the star. That seems more like an ensemble piece to me, right? Just keep reading. And some say, She's better than Meryl Streep. Who, who, say, who says that? I don't know, nobody, a lot of people. <laughs> Congratulations, you five ladies no longer have to pretend to be attracted to Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> Nominees are. So here's the thing. If people remember that, I'm sorry we had to do that whole big lead in until that, uh, but the point is people were not happy that he said it. He talked about the casting couch, which is one of those things you just aren't supposed to speak about. And he got ripped in in the media, like other stars were upset, other studio people, the, you know, it was like condemned and yet all of them knew it was true. So it is worse to talk about the rapist being a rapist and nobody doing anything about it than it is not to do anything about it, apparently. I experienced that when I called out Joe Biden because I believe Tara Reid and forces aligned with people like Sally Albright and David Brock and those people who work and have contracts with the DNC and the, and, and the PACs that work for the DNC or fund the DNC tried to get me fired from both of my jobs. There was a coordinated effort. Like I have the screenshots. I, I had conversations with my bosses. And one little funny thing, if I could just tell you, is that one of the things that wasn't just about Tara, because they said, oh, we have to branch out and not just talk about Tara Reid. Let's talk about how Anthony Zank is calling Joe Biden a pedo, which I've never said, right? They sent the video that I narrated about Biden's boundaries with children to my bosses and one of them, and this is a person in academia, I won't say at which school, said to me, I saw the video, it's really creepy. That was their response. So whatever you're doing out there to try, like, it's not working. 
people are seeing this. I, I don't know where we go from here. Maybe that's a conversation we could have in the future, but I see a connection between all the issues that you and Jesse talk about between rape and sexual violence, between uh, the way children are treated, the way we treat the working class, the way we treat the working class in other countries, our imperialism, uh, our, our horrendous in hyper-individualized capitalism, all of that's connected. And uh, I just think we just have to keep talking about it, pull that curtain aside and, and let people see what's really going on and, and have conversations with people because that's the only way things are going to change. Well, that's yeah, something that absolutely. we focused on at, like when we first started doing the show is one of the big things that we both said that we wanted to do was to make those connections that you just mentioned and to make sure that it's not, we're not looking at these things in a vacuum because these things don't happen in a vacuum. Um, all of these issues are interconnected. You know, it, 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 it's impossible to ignore once you make those connections. So I think that that's, you know, we just have to keep doing that as much as we can. And I think that it's, you know, maybe I'm being like naive, but I think that there's, um, you know, there's been some awareness I think that's come um you know the, the internet has really done that I think that's why they're so drastically trying to censor people on oh, the yeah. internet because I think that that really has been a game changer it's made it's made information easily accessible to people and so I think that it's that has opened up a lot of eyes um I think that we have to make sure that we seize on to that and try to really push through and, and, and really really combat um I mean that's why I do what I do because I feel like the um the fight for narrative management is the front line for everything. Um, it doesn't matter what you're fighting for. If you don't have the ability to educate people, to put information out, to receive information, you're, you're not going to be effective in your battle for any issue that you care about, whether it's healthcare or whether it's, you know, sexual assault or whether it's the environment or education, it doesn't matter. So that's why I do what I do. I think that that's one of the most important things that we're facing. So um, just thank you for doing what you do. I mean, like I said, your, um, your video that you just mentioned that was shown to your bosses, um, that was, uh, one of the the first times that I was introduced to your work, um, and it was really impactful. And I think it's censored you know, on Twitter, it, it's, yeah. it's censored as sensitive material. Yes, people have been censored for sharing it. Yeah. So if it's if it's offensive to share the video of Biden touching kids, <laughs> can we talk about why it's so not okay that Biden touches kids that way? One other thing, a little shameless self promotion. Uh, I do have a TEDx talk on capitalism. It's called Watch the Gap. If you put my last name and watch the gap in on YouTube, you can watch it. I got a couple of other videos too. We'll link to it. We'll link to all your stuff. And all that stuff. But let's keep having these conversations. Let's say the things people don't want us to say. I think it's, it's you know, it's all we can do at this point. Yes. And we would love to have you back anytime you want to come back on. Um, maybe we could have you and Tara on at the same time. Um, yes, that would so. be a really excellent conversation. I mean, we love having these conversations. I think it's really important. So um, yeah, thanks for coming on. Thanks for the work that you do. Um, thanks everybody for watching and we'll catch you next time. All right. Sounds great. Thanks, Jesse and Christy. Thank you. <clears throat>